Good. Will you pray with me? O oh, holy and gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation on all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you, O oh God, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So we continue in our series, Disconnected, and I want to remind us again of what I am seeking to address with this whole concept of being disconnected. And what I'm really talking about is that space, that gap between the things that we say and do and then the things that we value or believe in. And this is not a new human experience just for us. It's not like this just started happening yesterday and I needed to call your attention to it. Uh, this is part of being human. Uh, and, and we see that pretty, pretty vividly in this whole section of Luke. In fact, this whole chapter is a great chapter. They could come up with some new names for the whole chapter like Jesus does a face palm. Do you know what a face palm is? It's this. You know, because he's listening to the disciples, he's trying to teach the disciples, he's trying to invite the disciples to be the people that God has called them to be, and frankly, these guys don't get it, at least not at this particular point in the story. And so I kind of want to walk us a little bit into this part of the story. Um, we start with the opening of the chapter is Jesus has now sent the 12 out. He has given them authority. Uh, they have the, the authority and the power over all demons. They can cure diseases. And he has sent them out into the kingdom to proclaim the kingdom of God. And so they go out into uh, the world and they're gone for a while and then they come back. And when they come back, they tell Jesus all the things they had done. So we start this chapter knowing that Jesus had given them power and authority. Keep that in mind. Um, the next thing that happens is they feed the 5,000, and then uh, Jesus asks the disciples, so who, who do people say I am? You know, who am I? And, and Peter, of course, has the right answer. I don't think he really knows what the answer means, but he has the right answer. He says, you are the Messiah of God. And Jesus is like, okay, but don't tell anybody. It's just what he said, you know. And then he goes on to explain to him, okay, we're going to make our way to Jerusalem, and I'm going to be handed over, and I'm going to die, and in three days I will be resurrected. And they're like, okay, sure. Um, they don't quite understand that either. Uh, it, it's right after he tells them this story that he takes Peter and James and John and they go up on the mountain and, and we have this experience called the transfiguration uh, where all of a sudden Moses and Elijah are there and God is speaking and uh, Peter and James and John are, have no idea what to do with this. And let's face it, you and I would have no idea what to do with this. Uh, and, and God, you know, Peter's like, oh, we should, we should build something here to make this very special. And God's like, would you just be quiet and listen to Jesus? Uh, and so they come down from that. And then Jesus is approached by a man whose son has a demon in it. And, and the man tells Jesus, your disciples were not able to cast out this demon. Now, you remember when they were sent on the mission that they were given that power and authority. And yet we have a situation where they could not do that. And so Jesus was able to get the demon out of the child. And, and then Jesus tells them again, so we're going to Jerusalem I'm going to be handed over, I'm going to die, and I'm going to be raised in three days. And they're like, okay. And their response to all of this, which is why I call it Jesus and the face palm, their response to all of this is, so which one of us do you think is the best? Who's the greatest? Who gets to sit by you in your glory? Because uh, we've really been working very hard, and we think we're the best. We think we're super great. And Jesus is like, seriously? 
And he pulls the child in, and he tries to invite him, and he's trying to help them see that this whole experience, this whole calling to be his disciples, to be his followers, to be his partners in this great work of bringing forth God's kingdom is to not be focused on themselves, but to be focused on those around them. And so he, he shows them the child, and, and he thinks he's got it. And then John, who never says anything. I mean, John never says a peep in the Gospels. John is the one who pipes up and says, yeah, but, but you know what? We saw this guy, and he was, he was doing stuff in your name. He was healing. He was casting out demons in your name, and so we tried to stop that. And just like, don't. But he's not one of us. He doesn't do things the way we do things. And Jesus is like, you know, as long as he's doing the things that we do, as long as he's healing, as long as he's helping people to reconcile and be back and and get in relationship with God, he's with us. Anybody who is with us cannot be against us, right? And so this is kind of where this story takes us. So what does that have to do with us today? Well, this kind of thing happens, right? Um, So back when I was normal, before I went into the ministry, back when I was normal, I was was searching for something. I had, had worked at the newspaper, been at the corporate world for a while, and decided it was time for me to... Uh, well, it was, I really just needed to stay home. The kids needed somebody to be there after school, and I was able to do that, so I did. But I got a little restless. Uh, and you've got those hours during the day, and I don't want to spend every day cooking and cleaning. Uh, so I was looking for something to fill the time, and I thought, wouldn't it be fun, wouldn't it be great to be a substitute teacher? Has anybody ever been a substitute teacher? <laughs> right? Bless you. Just bless you. I mean, bless you teachers as well, but here's the thing. You teachers are in the classroom, and you set expectations. And when we walk in as substitutes, we never do things the way you do things, and we hear about it. Uh, And so I I learned pretty early on when I would walk in that I was going to disappoint at least one, if not seven, classes of children because I was not going to be able to do things exactly the way their teacher had done them. And that was really important, especially in the younger grades. And so I kind of learned this lesson early on, that there's more than one way to do this. One of the things that I did in one of my very first sermons here was I brought a load of towels. I didn't bring towels. You don't have to do my laundry for me this week. But I brought a load of towels, and I invited different people to come up and fold towels. And, we, and it, it, most of us folded towels differently. Some of us roll towels. Anybody roll towels? Mother, likes to, mother used to roll towels, and so I learned how to roll towels. Or, you know, do you just fold it in half, or is it the trifold? You know, and so we all have different ways of doing things. It still gets done, and there still is not a towel police. So it's okay for you to fold towels the way you fold them. Now, what does this have to do with us, and what does this mean for us today? Well, we've been talking about uh, a lot of the things that, that have been changing in our world. I mean, we can acknowledge that it's change that is happening all around us, Right? Uh, we get disrupted by technology. Uh, how, many of you, how many of you do not have a smartphone? There's just a handful. There's just a handful of you. If I, if I wait a couple more years and ask that question, that nobody's hand is going to go up. You know, we, we have really adapted to the technology that's been made available to us, and it changes things. So now, how many of you still have a landline in your home? There's a few more of those. There's a few more of those, but there, uh, people are walking away from landlines, right? Because we've got our cell phones. We can, uh, we can get that, that call anywhere, and there's no long distance charges and all of those charges that we used to be concerned about, right? You remember uh, how the phone used to have a whole different set of rules around it than it seems to have now. Now, if you have a cell phone, you're actually not supposed to make phone calls on it, Right? <laughs> You're not supposed to call anybody. You're supposed to text first and arrange for that phone call, right? There's all kinds of new rules that come out about things. But we adapt, and in the context of ministry, we are also seeking to learn how to adapt. 
Uh, and so our, the, the sermon title today is This and That, because what we do here, this is good, and this works for us, and this has meaning for us, and this fills a need within us. We are those people who enjoy being part of a community that gathers in space like this, that sings songs from like the 1700s. Um, we, we enjoy and, and get great meaning out of coming together as a group. But here's something I want you to think about. Uh, we as a staff attended a workshop several weeks ago uh, back in January called Fresh Expressions. And one of, the, one of the pieces of research that was shared with us is that in any given community, about one-third of the people would be comfortable with what you and I do. So about one-third of the Georgetown community is going to come and do this Sunday morning thing that we do. Now, is there something wrong with the other two-thirds? Well, no, not necessarily. Um, it's part of this shift that has been taking place. Uh, they called it a sociological misalignment, which is probably a phrase for a spelling bee. Uh, but basically what they're saying is that, so if one-third, if our maximum potential for people to come and be a part of what we do on Sunday mornings is one-third of the people in the community, what then do we do about the other two-thirds? We could ignore them. But this is where we get back to our disconnect. So our calling is to reach people and invite them into a life-giving, meaningful relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That is our calling. We're called to make disciples. Uh, we're still trying to understand what, what all those words mean. But basically, we're inviting people to get to know this God who loves them, right? Uh, and and when, when what we do is wait for them to show up here, maybe there's a disconnect. Now, it doesn't mean that what we do here needs to change, I mean, we can always improve, and, and we will continue to try new things in here, right, Garth? We do like to have fun in here. Uh, we will continue to do this, but we're recognizing there's two-thirds out there that aren't going to come in here and do that. And so we have a disconnect uh, in terms of understanding what our calling is and having this as the only available option. So what's the solution to that? Well, you come up with new ways of doing things. You come up with new ways of being in community beyond the Sunday morning setting. We also learned another little tidbit. I've learned about third space. Does anybody know about third space? I'd never heard of third space before. Okay, so first space is your personal life, your home. That's your first space, where, where you are, who you are, right? That's home base. Uh, and so all the people that make up your home are part of that first space. And then you have that space where either you're working or you're volunteering or you have a consistent space that you're involved in. So if it's work, it's all your coworkers, it's the customers you call on, it's the students in your class. Uh, it's the patients who come through your door, uh, but it is, that is your second space. Third space is what you do when you're not in your first or second space. So if we go back to the working years, the third space is the golf course, right? It's what you did when you weren't at home or you weren't at work. And what's interesting is so many of us in the church spend our third space time with other people in the church. But that's not true for all of us. How many of you actually have relationships outside of the church? Please raise your hand. Okay, thank you. I was really, that, that was a tricky one. That was a tricky one. So when you have these relationships outside the church, you have an opportunity to see spaces where we can connect with people, where we can invite them in a whole different way to get to know this God who loves them. 
Now, the way they broke down that two-third was there was about a third of those. I love that everything's in thirds. It makes it easy, and it's very, very Trinitarian, um, which works. So a third of them are very interested in what's called affinity groups. Anybody here like to eat? That would be everybody. Uh, and so dinner, you know, going and having dinner together on a regular basis could be an affinity group. Or let's say that you have another group that likes to go uh, and work out at the gym together. That could be an affinity group, although I've got to tell you, when you're working out, it's really hard to have a conversation with somebody, right? Uh, but begin to think about what are those spaces. Anybody bunko? Bunko, anybody? Yes, I know. I'm looking at Donna because I know she's, there we go. Lori plays bunko too. Those are spaces where people gather. What other spaces can you begin to think of? where people gather. There's walking groups. There's people who get together and do hiking or running, or I don't know how you talk when you're running either, but you can do that before a run and, and gather up again afterwards. Or there's, It's just a completely different way of thinking about how you encounter people in your everyday life. So about a third of them are going to naturally be drawn into something that is centered around an activity that they already enjoy. Now, you can take that activity and you can bring in, you can bring in your faith. You can bring in this experience of community into that. Um, it, it, you can even sing some Charles Wesley hymns if you want to, but make sure it fits the affinity group. Uh, the, other, the other group in that is, is a group of people who are really very isolated. And isolation happens for a lot of different reasons. It can happen for economic reasons. Uh, it, can, it can simply be social isolation. It could, it could just be a, an age experience of isolation. And what they have found is that for groups, that, that, that one-third that finds themselves kind of in isolation, dinner church is a great opportunity. And it's not necessarily the Wednesday night meal that we do, but it is out in the community where people that are not necessarily just the church, but where those who don't have somebody to connect with can connect. And so it is a, uh, the ones that we heard about were up in Seattle, and they were weekly. And I think they said they had about almost 40 of them going throughout the Seattle area. Now, I don't know if you know much about Seattle. Um, they don't talk about God a whole lot in Seattle. Um, Seattle's not a big church-going area, and yet these dinner churches have continued to grow. And so, yes, they're casting out demons, and they're casting out demons in the name of Jesus, and they're not one of us. And it's okay. And so I believe that our best opportunity is to do what we do here very well. And it is also for us to begin to look at how can we be in spaces where people are already connecting or create spaces where people can come together and get to know this God who loves them. So this is an opportunity for you to help us begin to identify what does that look like? How do we do it? And we're going to try some of these, and they are going to fail beautifully. And it's okay. We're going to keep trying because our calling is not to make sure everybody ends up in this space. We want this space to be here and be everything it needs to be for those who will. But we need to be aware that there are many who will not. And our calling is to also and be out in those spaces, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, offering this life-giving love that God has for us. Now, the Methodist Church is probably going to be in the news in the next week. Uh, we're having our general conference. Um, my crystal ball is still not working. I can't tell you how that's going to come out. We're going to be in prayer for all of those who are participating in that and have an opportunity to make decisions for the future of our denomination. But I need you to hear me. We have a calling right here. We have been invited into the work that God is doing in this church and in this community. 
So I simply encourage you not to be distracted. Uh, please be in prayer. But I assure you, God is still going to be God at the end of General Conference. And you and I still have an opportunity to meet the people who will walk through these doors and invite them into community. And we still have the opportunity to create community in new spaces with new people offering new opportunities for people to know God. I wish that would make the news. Because I think what God is doing in and through this congregation, because some of this has already started, I think it's very exciting. So I want to hear from you. I invite you to not only be in prayer for our denomination, but be in prayer for how we truly can be that church beyond the Sunday morning experience. How we can be that church that gets to know our neighbors in new ways. How we can be the church that ends that experience of isolation by bringing about community. I, I do think you're all very special. In fact, I think you're all very great. But our calling is not to be the best. Our calling is to love the best. So let us love well. Amen.